Hi, good, good evening. Thank you for joining our very first faculty update session. Um, this session is going to be focusing on memory services. Thank you for taking time to join on a Friday afternoon. Uh, we have three excellent speakers, or four excellent speakers. Uh, we'll first hear from Dr. Amanda Thompson, our faculty chair, who's going to give an overview on a national recommendation, followed by Dr. Venkat Muthukrishnan from TSS Kvya Valley Trust, who is going to describe how their services have started doing memory assessment uh, in the COVID situation. And then we have an interesting case presentation by Dr. Juliet Brown and Kate Bailey uh, and for some discussions. So after the talks, we'll have some time for question, but as the speakers are speaking, you are allowed, you, you can actually post your questions on the Q&A uh, kind of a box on your um, screen and it will get populated and we'll be able to answer the question towards the end. Uh, and the the session will be recorded and in due course it will be available for people to watch as well as the slides uh, will be available at the faculty resource page uh, and also all the all the information the references will be available on the resource resources page uh, and it's really exciting that we've got more than 140 people uh, here and without further ado i would like to uh, hand over to Dr. Amanda Thompson, our chair. Well, thank you very much for the introduction, Chris. The reason that we are holding this webinar is that numerous uh, people have been asking me about what memory services should look like in the current situation. So Alistair Burns convened a virtual meeting of a multidisciplinary group to write a short paper focusing on a kind of distillation of ideas and best practice. And with his agreement, I'm allowed to summarise this. Um, in this summary, I'm not discussing primary care assessments. And the final paper that Alistair is going to um, publish, uh, I don't have a date about that, um, and it won't be published under NHS e &I. In the meantime, however, what we have got for you is a paper produced by the London SEN, led by Jeremy Isaacs, who was also at this meeting, which you'll be able to find on our faculty website afterwards. So can I have the first slide, please? OK, so when we're talking about memory assessment clinics, there have been concerns, as you'd expect, about the potential for lowering the quality of services provided so that there needed to be some general principles. I don't think any of us would find these uh, surprising. Clearly services must be sufficient to meet the need. Some people might not be able to access technology and so could be disadvantaged. And it was felt that the thrust of new memory services shouldn't be to avoid the risks altogether or to push the risk only onto the families, but to recognise them, be honest and transparent with families and take steps to try and mitigate the risk. So can I have the next slide, please? Just moving on. Um, has it moved on? Yes, here we are. So it was the group was very keen to emphasize the sentinel role of a thorough and well informed history in the diagnosis of dementia rather than over reliance on cognitive test scores or brain scans. Indeed, clinical subtitling is based on uh, history. It was felt that this IQ code was a helpful instrument of proven validity, which allows uh, families and the person to detail the onset and progression of symptoms. Throughout this slide set, you'll see some links and the slides will be available. Next slide, please. This, this uh, slide has the information which I personally found most useful because I didn't know where to go for the evidence base. Um, by the way, when you look for NICE, don't do what I did, which was look for the short guidance. It's the full guidelines which have the links. So there I've given you some possible um, uh, cognitive tests that were discussed. Uh, the TICS does um, have uh, costs associated with it. And it was felt that uh, it was important that any 
uh, test that was used that clinician had to uh, be familiar with and know how to use it and also be flexible. And I think that's what came across. For instance, the carers perhaps sending a smartphone picture of the clock during a telephone assessment. Uh, so next slide, please. Uh, well, I've already seen there's a question about this. The take home message from this slide is that when deciding to arrange a scan or not, it's helpful to have guidance in place because you know people are worried about getting COVID and that a scan, if it's not going to change your management plan, does it really need to have to be done? So I've given you a link to some protocols uh, which have been uh, uh, set up uh, by other services, which you might find interesting. Again, with blood tests, this could be a problem. And it was felt that really, if the blood tests had been performed throughout the lifetime of the cognitive symptoms, that perhaps one needed a bit more flexibility than just six months. Next slide, please. When coming to the um, initiation of the cholinesterase inhibitors, there was a debate about whether you really truly needed an ECG, particularly for people who had no history of cardiac problems, perhaps asking a relative if they couldn't do it themselves to take the person's pulse as a proxy. Again, there's some guidance that's been produced on ECGs and their use. Then treatment isn't just about uh, medications, but you might think perhaps if you couldn't get an ECG, prescribing mamantine, if you could get an EGFR, obviously noting uh, where you could actually have, you know, they had the correct indications. But there are other treatment options, suggesting activities, um, offering the services of the Dementia Advisor Service and signposting perhaps by sending uh, information later on via post. Then we also need to think about carers and uh, the start um, uh, skills training is available for people online. Next slide, please. I think this is basically fairly self-explanatory. The key messages that came across from this group was that it's likely that COVID-19 will in some shape or form affect the way we deliver services and, we've, and it's going to be around. But this does provide us with a unique opportunity to change the way services are delivered. The hope was that by putting out some ideas and best practice and links, that it would help services moving forward. The paper, however, is very clear. It's not advocating one particular single model. It also says at the end that any financial implications would need to be considered. And you need to think about how you'd put in place some way of monitoring risk and quality of the experience. But as, as I said, Jeremy was at the meeting and a lot more detail about the testing uh, and how you have to adapt them uh, is in the document on the faculty website. Now, Chris also allowed me a little time to talk about updates. So I want to end by talking about the Community Mental Health Transformation Programme. I appreciate this is the English bit, so apologies if you're phoning from abroad. Next slide, please. Whilst I'm sure you're all aware of this piece of work, it's actually, despite COVID, NHS ENI are seeing this as absolutely critical area of focus. Um, so while there is some slippage in the timings, what they're saying to me is that uh, they are still going to allocate money in June 2021. So that we've got to get the proposals in by then. It, the, as I said, the timings uh, slipped a bit, but the same process as outlined in the bottom box will still apply. So. I want to just ask the next question. So the next slide, please. Are you ready? I mean, there are early implementer sites and I'll show you that later, but have you started to develop those robust links with local authorities, service users, voluntary sectors? The reason that's so important is that any of your proposals 
will have to genuinely show co-production. And if you haven't got those relationships, those trusted trusts, then when you try and put a proposal together in a rush, it's going to be difficult. So do you think COVID has given us opportunities to, to know and get to know our colleagues better? So the other thing is, I talked to NHS ENI and said, well, I'm, I'm doing this, what, do you, what are your key messages? They absolutely agreed with the first one and they added two and three about the impact of the pandemic. They were worried about that and how is your proposal responding to that and linking it with the frailty and ageing well agenda, which you know uh, I know you're already doing. So if you're doing this and you've already got your proposals kind of starting to be in place, fantastic. If you're not, I don't want you to lose out on the money. So the next slide, and this is my final one, is to give you a list of the early implementer sites, if you ever wanted to know who they were. So these are people who've already been given funded because they're actually started this community mental health transformation. And for those people who perhaps want a bit more detail or don't know too much about it, I've given you a link uh, to the framework. Now, interestingly, on the framework, it says, and you will be sent the implementation uh, guidance. When you'll go to me, well, where is it? Well, I'm told at the, eight, at the beginning of April that it's not written yet. So. It, it, we're still waiting for that, but please do uh, be part of this because I'd hate for the community services for older adults to be to miss out on this funding. So now I think I finished my update and I'm going to hand over to Venkat Muthra Christian uh, to talk about the realities of making uh, memory services work in this time. Venkat, you're muted. Sorry, um, apologies. Uh, good evening, everyone. I'm Dr. Venkatesh Muthukrishnan. Thanks a lot to Dr. Amanda Thompson for an excellent presentation. I'm going to refer to a lot of what uh, Dr. Thompson said during my current presentation. Uh, we are talking about delivering memory services during COVID crisis in TUV, the TSS Korea Valley Trust. Next slide, please. Sorry, can I have the next slide, please? Yeah, so this is uh, to you as a trust. Uh, as you can see, we are one of the largest mental health trusts covering a, a large area, covering from almost under, uh, just south of Newcastle to just north of Leeds. Can I have the next slide, please? So when the COVID crisis started, we had a discussion and we thought we had these two options of continuing business as usual, which is sticking to what we know works and face-to-face -face assessments. But we also recognize that the limitation of face-to-face -face assessment means we are uh, contributing to a further delay in diagnosis by putting off face-to-face -face assessments. Can I have the next slide, please? So what we did uh, was the Trust Speciality Development Group under the chairmanship of Dr. Mani Krishnan set up a working group of all the professionals and what we did was we reviewed the uh, comprehensive trust dementia care pathway uh, and added modifications to uh, enable us to continue to deliver assessments and treatment in a, in a remote fashion. Uh, next slide, please. So what we are doing or uh, starting to do is uh, basically divided into these four uh, steps for, for purpose of simplification. Uh, where appropriate, we will do a quick screening uh, which doubles up as a quick welfare check, as well as uh, explaining the process of assessment to the patient and their carers, offering them a choice to choose uh, to do a telephone or video assessment or to go on a waiting list awaiting face-to-face -face assessment. And then I'll talk a little bit more about assessment, diagnosis and treatment in the subsequent slides. Next slide, please. Uh, so in terms of assessment, uh, as again, Dr. Thompson very uh, clearly alluded to, uh, patient and collateral history is, is the key. And uh, already our memory services are um, doing everything they can and recognizing the 
importance of this are uh, taking extraordinary steps to get all the details. Now, in terms of assessment tools, again, Dr. Thompson gave an ex uh, excellent presentation of all the variety of tools available, which demonstrates that assessment is very much possible. We are already using the IQ code. We are already using the test wire, test your memory tool. We are using blind MOCA. We are also trying to use uh, Adam Brooks cognitive examination in a very practical way, so, uh, simply because we have the uh, for we are fortunate to be part of the Attend Anywhere pilot, and we are able to do a lot of video consultations. Um, and what we are recognizing is the importance of MDT discussion. So all of the above is uh, underpinned by a very careful MDT discussion. We are also mindful of patient anxiety, so it is going to be an interesting territory as to how these assessments are carried out. Um, next slide, please. So in terms of diagnosis, we recognize that neuroimaging and neuropsychological assessment might not be readily accessible, and one of the discussion points was could we have a working diagnosis and would that enable us and the clinicians the um, necessary uh, framework to kind of proceed with treatment? Actually, one of the GP leads from Scarborough made a very useful point about using SNOMED codes, which for those who don't know SNOMED codes uh, is actually the coding for primary care, the electronic coding. And under that, uh, there is a specific cognitive decline coding, which varies from no cognitive decline to very severe cognitive decline, which will also tally in with what the GPs expect us to do. Next slide, please. So treatment again, Dr. Thompson referred to how various options are available and I here I, I make reference to this very well uh, known article published by Dr. Rowland and uh, their team way back in 2007, which a lot of memory services have been using, which is a very pragmatic approach to uh, uh, pulse and ECG monitoring. Uh, and uh, we all also have at the moment memantin, which is a much, uh, which is an e equally uh, capable treatment option as an alternative where we have difficulties in monitoring uh, cardiovascular health of our patients. <coughs> uh, so this slide is um, the attend anywhere uh, I, and these slides will be circulated. I will encourage you to go on to that link, which tells how clinicians are using the attend anywhere. Uh, I will take reference to that particular comment made by my consultant colleague uh, where, where he had used it for a 100 year old patient with a, a remarkable effect and positivity. Next slide, please. So these are some of the feedback from our, my uh, some of the patients and stakeholders. I'll give you a few seconds to just go through it. Particularly interesting comment from the GP, uh, which is probably slightly controversial, but I'll give 10, 15 seconds for. OK, next slide, please. So these are statistics from just one of the memory services. Actually, the memory services here in North Allerton uh, for the last few weeks. They have continued to be able to do 12 initial assessments per week. Uh, they have achieved a 30% reduction in caseload uh, and a 15% reduction in waiting list. Uh, and over 95% of the patients who we contacted preferred remote assessment over waiting for face to face assessment. Next slide, please. So again, feedback from some of the professionals, a lot of some of them from the North Allerton Memory Service. Again, I'll give you a few seconds to read through some of them. OK, I'm not going to take credit for the excellent work uh, as commented by the nurse prescriber on the clinical supervision. It's actually my consultant colleague here in North Allerton, Dr. Lee Hunt, who has been leading on the excellent work in memory services locally. Next slide, please. Uh, we have to bear in mind and we are very, very aware all the time of the constraints and challenges. Um, one of them being the training requirements for professionals when you're starting to use all these assessments that, that, that are being validated to be used on the telephone or on video. 
uh, we also have to be mindful, uh, despite the fact that these tools are uh, validated for telephone assessments, the overall assessment, uh, uh, how are they valid in terms of being done over phone and video? Uh, what happens to the mild cognitive impairment and the complex and rare dementia sufferers uh, uh, is again uh, going to be uh, uh, going, going to be a challenge for us. However, we do feel very positive that actually uh, the telephone and video consultation offer us the opportunity to do serial assessments, to do multiple assessments, and that actually might build up as a good quality, um, high rich uh, clinical information that in turn will help us diagnose even MCI and complex and rare dementias. So we live in hope. Uh, again, uh, neuroimaging and neuropsychology again has been referred to well by Dr. Thompson. Uh, the, the, one of the links was actually pertaining to the Yorkshire and Humber Dementia Network, which has already given out some very practical advice around uh, um, neuroimaging, um, which we are already implementing in some parts of Yorkshire here. Uh, it is a very useful resource for uh, others to follow as well. Next slide, please. Uh, so finally, coming back to the first slide, which is looking at the pros and cons. Um, uh, of, of the current ways of uh, delivering memory services or continuing to deliver memory services. Uh, on the pros, uh, you, you've got it as a sort of a very user friendly, much more accessible option. We do believe considerable amount of resources will be saved, which then can be reinvested to develop uh, memory services further. Uh, and as I alluded to before, more serial assessments are possible, um, uh, which, which would give us a, a very rich clinical information. Uh, on the cons, of course, this is an untested model and there are confounding variables. Technology, as we have just found out at the beginning of my presentation, I'll blame this on the technology, uh, can 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 have its own issues. Uh, I mean, obviously it's not for everybody uh, with, with sensory impairment, uh, so there are uh, cons. Um, next slide, please. However, we would like to conclude by saying it is possible to deliver memory services during the current crisis, and we do believe pros outweigh the cons. Uh, and the most important thing, as far as we are concerned here in Tube, is that we are determined to keep this as a live process, which means we are closely and regularly reviewing and monitoring and evaluating, which means we repeatedly come back to that first process and kind of constantly update and modify, taking into account the feedback from clinicians. Thank you very much. Yes. Thanks so much, Venkat. Um, can everyone hear me OK? Great. Um, so I'm Juliet Brown. I'm an old age psychiatrist in East London, and I'm here with Kate Bailey. I'm a high trainee at Old Age and Journal Adult Psychiatry. So Kate and I uh, are presenting a fictional case, which is interactive. Um, so the idea is us, for us to think as a faculty about how we're approaching assessments in the community um, in the current context. So we will be asking you to write into the chat box or into the Q&A section with um, your answers. And we've been running similar things where we work in East London um, to try and think through the scenarios that we might be facing both on the wards and in the community um, and try and apply the, the many, many guidelines that are kind of coming through at the moment in a, in a practical way. Um, so we're going to ask you a few questions as we go through and feel free to type uh, your thoughts into the, into the Q&A. OK, can we have the first slide, the next slide? Thanks, and the next, and one more. Thanks very much. OK, so this is a new referral that you're a consultant in the older adult CMHT. Mr C is an 83 year old. He's got no known mental health history. He's presenting to his GP by phone. He's calling his GP with multiple health concerns in recent weeks, and he's also worrying about his memory. Uh, GP is not sure how to manage this. Uh, hasn't actually included past medical history or medication list, but he did mention that Mr C has not wanted to attend for bloods as he's been worried. Uh, he's received the government advice that he's vulnerable, so he's, he's isolating. Uh, next slide, please. So CPN in your team conducts a screening phone call. Mr C says he can't recall discussing the referral with the GP. He's worried about coronavirus, um, but he does ask if memory loss is one of the symptoms. 
The CPN can't get much more out of him, um, but he does agree that you can talk to his daughter. Um, me mental state recorded by the CPN is that he wasn't making much sense, struggling with his hearing, um, but he did deny any abnormal perceptions. Next slide, please. So initial thoughts. Um, for me, I guess we've talked about it with the memory clinic, collateral, extremely important in old age psychiatry. Um, also thinking about what information do we have on his medical history, medications and recent bloods from our electronic systems. We want to explore the presenting problem. I'm not sure what that is actually in this case. Um, we want to find out, I guess, from his daughter um, about his mood symptoms, any problems with thoughts or perceptions, um, any problems with his memory, personality, behavioural change, and if he's had any symptoms of or exposure to COVID-19. And I guess we, we can think about, should the assessment be done by phone or video? Can you take the next slide, please. So you check his records. He's had two or three acute admissions in the last five years and clinic visits to urology, haematology and respiratory medicine. His current medical problems are listed as hypertension, gastritis, duodenitis, and he's got an indwelling catheter after an episode of retention and a failed TWOC. Previous problems, pneumonia, PE and a chronic subdural hematoma, which is now resolved. He's also had several falls and his most recent acute admission was six months ago for an acute kidney injury, secondary to diarrhea and dehydration. Next slide, please. These are his medications. Next slide, please. And his latest investigations on the electronic system was six months ago. Um, so some renal impairment, um, he also had a CT head two years ago, which showed the subdural, which had now, which had by that time resolved. Um, also stable appearances, uh, age related and chronic small vessel disease. Next slide, please. So you get on to his daughter, who's a nurse in Kent, and she hasn't seen her father since the lockdown began, but they speak every week. Um, and he's a former builder. He's always been quite a heavy drinker, a couple of bottles of whiskey a week plus beer um, and more so since his wife went into a nursing home and she's got dementia and that was about 18 months ago. Um, he's been very social in the past, goes to the pub, but when, in their phone calls each week he's been sounding increasingly low, asking when he can go out, worried about getting the virus, but also very worried about his wife and, and perhaps her getting the virus as well. And he's always refused a care package um, and he hasn't reported any cough or fever and hasn't been out of the house uh, except for next slide. Um, the neighbour has called the daughter to say that she saw um, Mr C out at the off licence last week. Uh, and the neighbour normally helps with shopping, but isn't really sure if he's eating the food that she's leaving for him outside um, and doesn't hasn't been able to go inside. So she doesn't know how well kept the home is. Um, she was quite worried about him, so she took her phone to the door last week so the daughter could talk on a video call and the daughter was very shocked to see how much weight Mr C had lost and thought he looked really rough. Um, and he seemed to really struggle with, with how the video was working. Next slide, please. So first question for you, you all, um, what, what are you worried about? What are your concerns at this moment? Please. Add your comments into the, the live Q&A and we'll pick them up. Everyone's a bit shy. What are you worried about at the moment with this gentleman? OK, um, so question of whether he needs um, a repeat CT because he's got a known subdural and he's on a Pixaban. Um, I think so worries about self neglect. Um, there's some mood symptoms we've pick, picked up, um, potential for delirium. Uh, def people worried about whether he's had increased alcohol consumption, um, vernicase or alcohol um, withdrawal. 
um, and someone suggested sort of needing to include exclude uh, physical factors basically um, so and worries about nutrition um, so thinking that he probably needs a medical review um, yeah fantastic right, yep yeah, next slide please yep yeah, exactly as you've commented we're worried about his mood um, we're worried about the weight loss is he eating is he drinking um, in terms of alcohol is he drinking more or does has he suddenly not got access to alcohol there seems to be a new confusion um, and there's some history of self-neglect and vulnerability when he was physically unwell previously with the diarrhea um, also a question of is he able to manage his medications next slide please So there's some really helpful advice um, from the Royal College about uh, drinking, well, not to drink during COVID, but how to manage problem drinking during COVID. Um, and the suggestion being that, you know, if someone's drinking to a harmful but not dependent uh, level, then you'd aim for a gradual reduction. But obviously, as we all know, um, for those who are dependent, then there's a need to manage the risk of withdrawal. And that could be using uh, an alcohol detox um, and, and the need to use Pabronex to prevent uh, Vernicase and, and Corsakoffs. Next slide, please. So you make a call to Mr C. Uh, he agrees to talk to you when he hears you're a doctor. He's worried about his wife. He hasn't been able to see her for weeks. Um, he's waking up early. He's feeling hopeless. Um, he usually calls the care home and calls the GP, but he hasn't had the energy to do this in the last few days. Um, can't remember what he ate today um, or whether he's, he's drunk anything at all. Next slide, please. He's quite irritated when you ask about alcohol. Um, can't tell you what medication he should be taking. Um, he does say that he's in pain from his catheter. He has heard the neighbour knock earlier on, but he hasn't made the effort to go down and see what she's left for him. To be honest, he says he hasn't been dressed in days. Um, he feels a bit unsteady on his feet, in fact. And he's quite tearful on the phone saying, what's the point of it all? Next slide, please. So I think we've probably covered a lot of these already, but um, if you've got sort of, if that changes your differentials or you're thinking of, of um, what might be going on with Mr C, again, I think some people have already said he needs some medical review, but um, what, what are your thoughts on his diagnosis at this time? type your answers into the, the Q&A. Yeah, people worrying about depression. Any other thoughts? Yeah, alcohol. Um, yeah, normal pressure hydrocephalus from someone. Lots of votes for depression. Okay. Yeah, and, and we know it's old age psychiatry, so it couldn't be just one thing. Depression, anxiety, alcohol. Yeah. Should we take yeah. the next slide? Yeah, next slide. Next slide, please. Yeah, so we had a list which included depression, an adjustment reaction possibly to his wife, uh, not being able to see his wife, uh, alcohol withdrawal, or an alcohol related cognitive impairment. Um, delirium obviously could be secondary to COVID, um, very common reportedly. Uh, could be a catheter issue, could be many other causes. Uh, dementia, could be the development of his, his cognitive problems, uh, could be a new uh, subdural. Next slide, please. Um, so I don't really need to tell you that depression is very common in older adults. Um, and obviously the figures that we had were from before COVID. 
Um, and I guess whilst we know that um, isolating older adults is perhaps helpful for preventing them from catching COVID, um, it puts them at kind of greater risk of social disconnection. Um, and the impact is, of course, greatest for those who were already isolated, so people who don't have family, those who are disadvantaged and already marginalised. Um, and as has already been kind of discussed briefly, is that um, while some people are able to use technology to stay connected to family um, and health services during this time, um, there are many people who won't be able to use or don't have smartphones um, or, or struggle because of cognitive impairment. Um, next slide, please. So what, what do you need to do now? What's your next step? This relates quite quite closely to the, the discussion from earlier on about using phone, using video or. Should we go on to the next slide? Yeah. I'm thinking about doing a home visit. Yeah, needs to be seen in person. Absolutely. So this is a guidance from the college again about working in community mental health settings. We do need to establish if the visit's essential. Um, I think we know it is in this case now. Um, we need to try and warn the person that will be coming in PPE. Uh, establish if he's symptomatic or not. I think we've had a discussion with him uh, and with his daughter. We know that he's not been following the guidance um, on isolating, um, but we don't think he's symptomatic. We don't think it's suitable to do a doorstep assessment in this case necessarily um, and we need to prepare our PPE. Next slide please. So this is the very handy visual guide to safe PPE. So in the community we're looking at the left hand side uh, general contact um, and this would be for all assessments at the moment. Um, so the surgical face mask uh, disposable apron and gloves and obviously in the community we need to think about where we're putting those on and how we're disposing of them after the visit. Next slide please. So you visit Mr C, a neighbour lets you in the house, it's a mess, there's no electricity on, um, there are uneaten meals lying around um, and unopened blister packs of medication. You find him in his bed, he's unshaven, he's underweight um, and you see an empty scotch bottle on his bedside. It looks like his catheter has come out and he's lying in urine. Next slide please. He won't turn his head at first to talk to you. Um, he's clutching a framed photograph of his wedding day, um, not answering your questions at first, difficult to get him to focus. He's quite tearful, he appears low, he's shaking his head, he's just saying, has she died, has she died? Um, doesn't seem to be responding to any unseen stimuli, doesn't recall your phone call from earlier, um, and he can't tell you what day it is or what time. He looks quite dehydrated. Um, you take a, um, do a physical exam, it's got a heart rate of 110, respiratory rate, rate of 24, he's afebrile, Sat's 93 and his blood pressure's 100 over 60. So next slide, please. So what are your thoughts now having this more information? Um, what do you think might be going on? So I think people have already kind of preempted some of these things um, with various diagnoses that I think a lot, many of the same diagnoses are coming up, I suppose, um, vascular depression, alcohol, delirium, um, one thought that GP probably should have visited in the first place, um, we need to call an ambulance now, um, does he have COVID delirium, um, he probably needs admission, um, so yeah, certainly, uh, next slide please. So we thought 
as you guys have pointed out, he's an 83 year old man. He's probably got alcohol dependence. Um, he's got low mood now, unclear alcohol use recently, self neglect, um, increased social isolation. He's not eating or drinking, probably not taking medication, risk of deterioration in, in a whole range of areas, including risk of alcohol withdrawal, um, self neglect, dehydration, uh, VTE and, and further physical deterioration. Um, so I think as we've not got much time left, I think some of you have already pointed out what needs to happen. So he needs to go to A&E. Um, he uh, needs possibly a medical admission, but we don't quite know yet. He might have sepsis. Um, he's certainly physically deteriorated. Um, yeah, period of assessment in hospital. OK, next slide, please. So imp important points to hand over. He's, he seems acutely confused, judging by the collateral and our assessment. He's at high risk of Wernicke's, uh, both due to his alcohol use and his malnutrition, um, and at risk of an alcohol withdrawal delirium. Uh, there is a potential that he'll go into retention, if his catheter's out, and he's at risk of thrombosis, which we know is also a, a COVID risk um, as well. Uh, we're not clear what his COVID status is, but as someone's pointed out, he does have a high respiratory rate. Um, he's also tachycardic and is dehydrated. And we think he needs a review by the liaison team uh, at the same time, obviously, as the medical assessment, um, because we're suspecting a low mood, uh, which has contributed to this presentation. Next slide, please. So he's taken to A&E. His blood show an acute kidney injury and dehydration. Has a CT brain, shows uh, nothing acute, um, but there is progression of his moderate small vessel disease. He's given Pabronex and charted for chlorides epoxide, but it's not required. So he remains confused for some days and has an ongoing assessment by the delirium and dementia team. And his COVID swab comes back as negative. Excellent. Next slide, please. So I guess overall, um, the key learning points with this case um, are just that there are risks associated with isolation um, and loss of social support. Um, some older adults may be more vulnerable physically and psychologically. Uh, and really importantly, access to alcohol can be variable. So that can either precipitate, precipitate more drinking or potentially less drinking and, and resulting in withdrawal. And as we've already also seen, there might be less information available for assessments. Uh, next slide, please. Um, but also reassuringly, our basic psychiatric and medical skills remain relevant and there will still be times where we need to do face to face assessments. Um, I think we'll finish there. Yeah, so we think we hope there's there's plenty there that's familiar in that case, um, but just wanted to include a, a few one or two additional factors to bear in mind um, during this period. We know that some older people will be struggling, um, but obviously where necessary, we, we do still need to do face to face assessments. Um, and we're going to hand over to Josie now, I think, to follow up on some of your questions. Thanks very much. Hello, everybody. Can you hear me OK? Wonderful. So thanks for those fantastic presentations. Um, the Q&A has been extremely busy, so thank you for that and for engaging with all the talks. It's great to see all your questions. I don't think we'll be able to ask all of them, but I've been looking through them and there's lots of similar themes coming up. So I'm going to direct some questions and popular questions to the people that I think may be able to answer them the best. Um, so I was going to start with Amanda. So one question that's come up from Chris Kalafatis is about funding. So Amanda, will the NHS immediately fund digital transformation of trust memory pathways and have these early adopting trusts received any funding? Uh, I don't know of any um, mention of any extra funding, no. So that's the first thing. I think probably Chris can say whether or not they had fun, extra funding, but there was a definite uh, interest in the attend anywhere as a, as a potential. That was the one that got talked about the most. But no, no, I'm afraid not. No, no mention of funding. Sorry.
OK, thanks for that answer, Amanda. Uh, another question for you is about um, what do you think about issues of assessments being done for the Court of Protection, about those being done remotely and any issues that arise with this? Uh, we, did, we did discuss this as a faculty exec and we felt that uh, we should be encouraging when we've got other things, to, better things to do, that we shouldn't be doing those. Um, and that uh, we were talking to, suggesting that people talk to their legal department about whether that could be put uh, to the court. Um, I, I do know that members have said that they have done remote assessments um, uh, and other trusts I hear they've managed to uh, say that they're not going to do it. So it has varied, but then I think the number of uh, referrals again varies between trusts. So our, our, you know, our, our best uh, um, advice at the time was to say, talk to your legal team to see if you could explain why this isn't the best use of clinical resources. Great, thank you for that, Amanda. And now I'll just have a few questions for Venkat. So thanks for your presentation, Venkat. And um, lots of questions, I think, for you about your practical experience of this. Wondering how many of your patients are being seen remotely? What sort of percentage do you think? And also, how are you getting around issues of pulse checks? Who is doing those? And also, how about people that may need a neurological examination? How have we been dealing with that? Venkat, please put your video oh, on. Oops, sorry. <laughs> sorry, technology again. Sorry, uh, I'm not following the instructions very well. Um, sorry, can people hear me? Yeah, OK, so so those three. So those three questions, um, the first one was about the percentage of people. Um, we have just about started evaluating that, but as I was uh, saying in one of the slides, locally at least 95% um, of those patients asked had we, had wanted to do telephone assessment. So we are basically offering them uh, initial assessment via telephone or, or video. Um, so that was the first question. In terms of pulse, I think that's a really good question. Uh, I haven't collected uh, feedback from all the memory services, but certainly again going with anecdotal examples here locally, Locally, uh, services again are uh, clinicians are again being very innovative. Uh, there are there are obviously equipment that measures pulse. Some some patients have that. We we also have uh, district nurses and and. Uh, going into some 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 patients houses so we request them to do do pulse uh, so those have been just the anecdotal uh, examples that i've got and uh, and where there are clear issues like if there are any hospital records that says the person has significant bradyarrhythmias or, or or reduced pulse we obviously go go down the memantine route um, again having bloods uh, uh, showing a good egfr will enable us to go down that route uh, in terms in terms of the third question about neurological assessment, um, again, that's probably what what I re referred to by means of uh, those sort of complex uh, dementias, uh, where there isn't, uh, you know, with the, with the MDT information, uh, the MDT discussion with the, all the information we have obtained. Um, uh, and if, if you feel that there is a need for a neurological assessment, those uh, set of patients are, uh, you know, placed on a waiting list and we have explained things to them and uh, arranged for face-to-face face assessment. To face assessment. Thanks very much for that, Venkat. Thank you. Um, just a few questions for Krish now. A lot of questions about um, the importance of scans, of using CT scans, and um, the logic and value of routine memory clinics under the circumstances is one question that's come up. 
is it appropriate to be doing routine memory assessments at this time? And what do you think about the importance of scanning? Hi, thank, Hi, thank, thank you, Josie. And th thank, thank you for thank everyone, everyone uh, uh, for all uh, the, for the all questions. questions. I think uh, some of the speakers, can you mute? I can't, uh, I can get my own echo. Right, uh, so the question, I think somebody called Neil replied to that question already, but I just want to uh, give you a few pointers. Number one, first of all, we can have our own concerns about various things. What we did in our trust, again, that's something for you to think about is, what does the patient want? That's the key in this whole thing. If the patients are going to the doctors and referring for um, referring them to be referred for them to be assessed for their memory, so they are actually concerned about their memory. So asking the patients, what do they think we need to do in the COVID situation? And we did that. In fact, Venkat's team did that. Almost 85% of the patients we spoke to actually saying, even in a slightly different way, we are happy to uh, have your assessment done and we are happy for you to do the assessment uh, in a in a slightly roundabout way. So how many of you are actually ringing these patients and asking that? And then there was another question popping. Some of uh, my patients may not be IT savvy, but it's not for everyone. But those 75 percent of the pa patients, why are we depriving them? And the other point, uh, Neil has nicely summarized it. How many of these memory diagnoses in the last 100 patients you have diagnosed, you had to really rely on CT scan only? So that is something for us to think about. And the other thing, somebody also, I think lots of answers are there in the comments. So we'll try to summarize that. How many of your CT scan, radiology CT scan reports actually are extremely helpful for you to make that clear, clear subtype? In fact, as a faculty, our question should be, how can we improve that? How can we get the PAC success at post-COVID? And again, I'm not going to lie to you, in James Cook University Hospital, four weeks ago, they told us you can't have scans for dementia diagnosis. However, this week they said, from 18th of May, you can we can we are reopening our scanner for your thing. So it is about if if we have to wait for them to say we are open for business, I don't think we'll be there. And the other point I think Venkat mentioned, we are assuming there is a lot of assumptions here. For somebody, COVID may be devastating, which is understandable. For somebody who are fighting with this memory problem for three to four months and put them onto a lockdown, put them onto social isolation, it is going to be even more worse. So I do think that I, I use the mantra in our trust is what is the risk and what is the need? If the need is low and the risk is low, I fully agree that we don't have to do a lot of things, but the need is going up and the risk is also going up. We need to do something about it. And the other some and there was a question on pulse. So uh, Mani Chandran has replied, teach the family to take pulse. We have gone one step further. There are some remote devices available. They have to just touch the device. You will get the pulse. Even better, you will get a six lead ECG. So it is about, I think, uh, uh, I know this is like war time, and I've used it with some of our consultant colleagues who had almost the same level of questioning uh, that uh, I, I said, we don't want perfection to be the enemy for progression. So I think I can fully understand in a COVID situation, we may not be able to do an ideal memory clinic, but please reflect and see how many of you of every single memory assessment, you are actually providing an ideal memory clinic service. So it is about, I know I'm challenging, but it is something we need to be reflecting. So, sorry, I've, I've, I've talked too much. Josie, is there any other question? So a really good question has just come up from Chris, um, which I was just talking to someone else about this morning, actually. Should we not be starting to see more patients if they consent or if it's in their best interest at home or in clinic, medical outpatients with PPE um, and precautions, 
start are starting to run as are diagnostics, e.g. CT and MRI, and we seem happy enough with carers, GPs, district nurses seeing patients and happy to send them to A&E and have them admitted to medical wards. So how do we continue to justify not seeing people face to face? OK, so again, that's a valid question and as well as an answer. Again, there are two things here. Number one, our older population are vulnerable, so they are already on a kind of a shielding process, so that we need to give uh, due respect. And also we, as a footfall, if we are going around, you know, again, there is a new change with the lockdown changes, um, that how are we going to not take something to them? and? Just as a practical example, my clinic is currently a donning and doffing room for one of our wards. So we are already starting to look at estates, starting to look at uh, how we can look at it. No, I, I agree, Chris. I, I can't see why at some point we will be looking and it, it, the point remains. It goes back to the patient and as somebody mentioned, why are we doing all this to just to give a evidence evidence based genepicil which doesn't do a lot? I don't think that's a good uh, way of looking at it. Dementia diagnosis is not just about prescribing genepicil. It is a lot of thing. I'm sure patients and family are waiting for it again. In the last three weeks, we have done more than in my T side team. We have done more than 34 diagnostic appointments, but there are about eight patients and family who said we don't want electronic, we want face to face, take your time and we are not worried, but the majority are wanting to go ahead. So I do think that we should start looking at that. Thank you. Any other comment questions, Josie? Thanks very much for that, Chris. So um, Chris, sorry, Chris, it's been a long week. Um, so it's four minutes to five by my clock and it's Friday afternoon and so I'm thinking we should begin to draw this to a close. This is the first time we've done this so we really would value your feedback on how it's gone and what you'd like to see us do differently. We're hoping to run a lot more of these in the future um, particularly as well what topics you'd like to see covered and any people you'd particularly like to hear from. So I'm going to put my email address in the Q&A bar so do please send me your thoughts and your feedback and any f ideas for future topics. Um, in case you can't see the Q&A bar, it's josie.jenkinson at sabp.nhs.uk and hopefully we'll get some good feedback from you all. So finally, just like to thank all the speakers. Thank you so much for giving up your time. So thank you, Amanda, uh, Venkat, Krish, uh, Kate and Juliet and thank you all very much for attending this event today. Thank you.